Good morning. A warm welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum. To those joining us here in person at the Mountain View Senior Center and online. My name is Ray Sunby, president of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a secular and reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the humanist community if you have not yet done so. Membership forms are available on our website. A special welcome to those who are with us for the first time. We invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find all our events listed on the website. Please aid us in continuing to present these forums by donating to the humanist community. You can find out how to donate to our organization on our website, www.humanists.org. Thank you, Ray. Uh, okay, in, in this lecture, uh, Melanie Neimark, uh, we'll look at uh, Ukraine in several ways. We'll discuss the geography, history, uh, demography, the language, uh, culture, including music, folklore, famous scientists, achievements. And should go into modern history, uh, including the current 10-year war. Also prospects for the future and hopes. Um, she's also, by the way, brought some Ukrainian dishes to share with us. Uh, Ms. Nymark was born in Kiev. Uh, in Ukrainian, Polish, and Russian mixed family. As a child, she studied piano, voice, and music theory. She competed in figure skating until she was 14 and joined uh, archaeology expeditions most of her life. She received a Bachelor of Math with honors from the National Math and Science Lyceum in Kiev. Uh, she earned a Master's in Architecture from National Art Academy, also Kiev, and studied in the, in the PhD program in architecture at the Moscow Prototype and Massed Housing Institute. She printed, spent her professional life in New York uh, and for, four, for 14 years and uh, for two, two years in, in Berlin. In uh, New York, she worked as an architect focused on mass transit, healthcare, and schools in public buildings. In 2005, she worked in healthcare design at Kaiser Permanente and Stanford Medicine in California. Currently, uh, she's head of uh, the art, excuse me, she's head architect in North California for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, she's also co-founded a charity organization, Nova, Nova Ukraine, Ukrainian focused charity. Uh, and uh, she founded Ukraine, Y-O-U-K-R-A-I-N-E in 2003, where she still serves. Uh, would you welcome Milena Neymark? Thank you so much for introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, it's really lovely. So um, as you all know, Ukraine is kind of hot subject right now. So I'm going to, uh, I think I have a, a little better perspective to kind of uh, get you introduced and uh, a little deeper, um, give you a little deeper understanding of what's going on. So, uh, oh, closer. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, the um, the presentation today um, it's a, short, a fairly short time, so I'm just going to be kind of uh, jumping all over the place. So the Ukraine uh, first slide, please. Uh, I can start like this. So the um, Ukraine. Um, first of all, I want to explain. Um, we cordially, we Ukrainians cordially ask everybody not to call us the Ukraine, it's Ukraine. And there is a little bit of political background on that one because the Ukraine means that it's just part of something, but Ukraine is actually a separate independent uh, democratic state and we don't wanna be calling part of something. We're just independent. So this little V actually makes, makes a lot of sense. And same, same translates in Ukrainian and Russian. Um, and another little, um, also language uh, kind of explanation um, is that um, 
uh, Kiev, the uh, capital of uh, Ukraine. It used to be on all the maps spelled with uh, K-I-E-V, and, uh, and that is the Russian pronunciation. Ukrainian pronunciation is Kyiv, and it's spelled now K-Y. IV. So it's a small difference, but a lot of meaning. It's super painful right now. And, you know, we try to explain everybody why we're so sensitive. Okay, so um, as you see, our flag is um, blue and yellow, and I'm going to touch base on it a little bit later. So that's the flag, and this is our um, uh, Trezup, which also has historical uh, roots a uh, long, long uh, time ago. Um, in terms of ethnic groups, it's predominantly Ukrainians and then about 78%, uh, 17% Russians and five others. Um, <clears throat> okay. um, uh, our government is a unitary semi-presidential republic. President, as you all know, Vladimir Zelensky. Population is 33 uh, plus millions. And that is uh, kind of a tragedy because even 15 years ago, it used to be 53 million, uh, but then we lost several regions and also a lot of um, uh, immigration, hopefully temporarily, but uh, who knows, because uh, usually once people got displaced, they may never come back. And the longer they stay in, in immigration, the less chance that they will come back. So right now it's 33, and that's the projections from last year. It might be even less this year. Also, the birth, obviously, with the war, like nothing is going on. Um, the area is about um, just above 600 square uh, kilometers, 600,000 square kilometers. And that is just to give you a perspective. It's um, roughly the size of uh, France and um, about two and a half Great Britons by this size. And, um, um, and um, Ukraine is the biggest country, um, European country, fully um, European, because Russia is obviously there, but not the full uh, country within Europe, so we don't count Russia for that. Um, the, um, uh, just a tiny bit of um, economy, so the uh, national currency is hryvna, and it's uh, started to be used since 91, since we got the uh, independence finally. Um, uh, and GOP for 2023 total is 474 billion and per capita is 14,000, which is not much, but that's what we have. Uh, geography, so this is the map of Ukraine and uh, you can see now, now in green, these are the occupied territories, but that's actually before the full-scale invasion, uh, the latest one. Um, so everybody's saying we just had a celebration, uh, not celebration, anniversary, a very tragic anniversary of the two years of starting the full-scale war. But I want to explain that it actually is not two years, it's 10 years, because the invasion started with the Crimea 10 years ago not two years ago. There have been people dying every day for 10 years. And unfortunately, um, um, we kind of guilty, we as Americans, I'm now American, but I'm Ukrainian born. And I, even though I did a lot to help Ukraine, but I always feel that we probably didn't do enough because had we addressed that issue 10 years ago, it wouldn't be what it is now. So um, geography um, of Ukraine, I'm going to start with um, um, just a relief. Um, uh, so Kiev, so um, as you see, it kind of in the middle of everything. And that's the main, um, it's the, the main uh, uh, characteristics of Ukraine. Ukraine has always been on the crossroads of everything. So through the ages, I'm not going to go through all the little details about the history. It's fascinating history. But to make it simplified, I'm going to touch back base real quick. But uh, the idea is, the sense of it is, Ukraine always been, everybody went back and forth in every possible direction. And, you know, and Ukraine always be, was between all these huge empires and all this suffering. It's a wonderful land and wonderful people and incredibly um, unhappy history. But we hope uh, for the future it's going to turn for the better. So, um, <clears throat> maybe. Uh, 
Most of the country lies in great European plain with some mountains in the south in Crimea and alpine system on the West Carpathian mountains. If you can see, that's what I'm uh, talking about. And the main, um, <clears throat> Um, what I want to explain about Ukraine, it's always through the ages, from the ancient times, it's always was a hybrid of something. So on the south, um, you have just a tiny bit of subtropical climate, but then you have steppes. Uh, roughly half of the territory of Ukraine is steppe, as you see on the second um, uh, slide. And then the other half, um, half is forest. So in the steppe, of course, you can't really do much crops, but this is a wonderful place for, uh, you know, for cattle. And as a matter of fact, um, there are latest discoveries that prove that most likely the first domestication of the horses happened in the Ukrainian steppes. So horse is also our like symbol of the country. Um, and then on the temperature for forest, it's just opposite. It's a wonderful climate and conditions for agriculture. One of the best in the world soils with um, up to five feet of black, very fertile um, uh, soil. And uh, it's called Chernozyo. And uh, uh, <clears throat> And um, it has a Ukraine has continental climate, and because of this, uh, we have just amazing conditions for uh, growing grains, and that was going on there for centuries and thousands of years because it's so fertile. Um, Chernozoms are quite deep, almost five feet thick and rich in humus. Ukraine is was one of the most fertile countries in the world and well known as a bread basket of the world. Um, Ukraine is bordering by waters with Black Sea and Sea of Azov and by, <clears throat> by land. Ukraine borders, unfortunately, Russia and Belarus and then Poland. Uh, just a second. Um, and, and then Poland, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, um, Romania, and Moldova. And, um, <clears throat> and of course, um, most of the borders are with Russia and Belarus, and that's the key problem for us. Okay, um, history. So, um, again, the history, next slide, please. Um, history of uh, Ukraine starts with Tripilia. Um, Tripilia is uh, translated as uh, three fields, and this is kind of um, the old, um, oldest settlements that were found in the territory of Ukraine, and they have uh, wonderful cities. They were wonderful. Uh, they were wonderful uh, farmers and had quite a bit of. Uh... One second. Uh, and also um, were using plow and were quite skillful craftsmen. Uh, remains of the large cities are now excavated and could be explored. Um, <clears throat> the first known people of the steppes, on the other sense, were Sumerians. And you can see it in the uh, yellow on the very first fly, uh, slide. The tri um, uh, tripilia is in blue and uh, Sumerians are in Yellow And the same thing, again, once were nomads, the other ones were settled farmers, and that's what Ukraine always is. They compromise between something, between Christianity and Muslims, between nomads and settled farmers, always um, all this diversity. Um, um, so then uh, the first known state in Ukrainian lands was Scythia, and that's the next slide, second slide in dark um, blue that shows where Scythians uh, used to be. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, treasures of Scythians, but they're absolutely amazing. Uh, golden pectorals and a lot of uh, findings were all done in Ukraine. As you can see, most, most of the Scythian state was within Ukraine. Um, uh, Scythian herdsmen lived in the steppe and raised cattle. Scythian plowmen inhabited the forest steppe. They, they actually had different parts of Scythian community, but they were all kind of together. And their successors also lived nearby and fought side by side. 
Sarmatian nomads and Vindian plowmen. And that's the third slide. So now we're talking about 300 BC to 400 AC for quite a long time. After that came uh, Goths um, and kind of pushed around uh, <laughs> previous tribes. Um, and as you can see, it was just like, you know, one tribe's coming, another going, and Ukrainians are kind of, there was no Ukrainian per se, because Ukrainians is this composition, uh, <laughs> um, cocktail of genes of all these people. For example, Syrians completely dissolved, but they're probably just dissolved in our blood. Um, okay, um, then uh, after Goth uh, came the, uh, in the 6th century BC to 6th century AC, Greek, Romans, Byzantines colonies were all established on the northeastern shore of the Black Sea. Um, and um, actually, I was very happy as a student, I've participated in a lot of archaeological expeditions in Crimea. They were just wonderful, and I hope we're going to get that back soon. <laughs> Unfortunately, all the museums in Crimea were robbed by Russians. They pretty much took everything that they could. So it's we're back to square one with that. During the 10th and 11th century, Kiev and Rus became the largest and most powerful state in Europe. So um, a period known as the Golden Age. Actually, um, with the reign of Vladimir the Great, uh, who introduced Christianity. Um, uh, after him followed his son Yaroslav the Wise, who was um, one of the most powerful um, ruler at that time. And he was creating all kinds of political unions with countries by marrying his children. He had eight children, four daughters and four sons, and married them all to different uh, countries. One of the uh, most famous story is about his uh, daughter, Anne, who became the Queen of France. And she came uh, with a lot of uh, goodies uh, when she was traveling. She never uh, saw her future husband, of course. And she brought with her um, um, a huge library. She spoke five languages. She was very educated. Kiev at that point was uh, like a world uh, class capital. And when she arrived, she was completely disappointed because uh, French people, Paris at that time, they didn't even use, they ate with hands. They didn't know what to bath. They, uh, the king obviously couldn't read or understand any other languages than, other than French. So that was a shock for her, but she was known as a wonderful queen and she helped him all along and still remembered as a great queen of France. Um, after, Um, so with the golden um, age of uh, Kiev and Rus, uh, we kind of come to a very tragic uh, event because uh, in, uh, uh, so Kiev and Rus finally disintegrated into separate uh, principalities following uh, one of the king's deaths, Mstislav, through um, owning of Kiev uh, would carry great prestige for decades. In the 11th and 12th centuries, the nomadic confederacy, um, the Turk-speaking Kuman uh, Serkankan, was dominated force in the pointing step of the Black Sea. Um, so... Um, um, the next few slides show again how the map was changing uh, year by year. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to go through, the, uh, through all of this, but basically uh, through the history, uh, through the years, uh, of course, the big deal was the um, um, Kiev was completely destroyed in um, in uh, eleven in twelve. Uh, I'm sorry in. Uh, by uh, Golden Horde and um, uh, was uh, in, completely in ruins for about um, 150 years. It never kind of recovered completely after that. Um, but um, other than this, Kiev was um, um, all the time, uh, not Kiev, Ukraine 
uh, was uh, coming from one to another. First they were pigeon eggs, then it was Polovshan, then there was the Golden Horde, um, then uh, there was Poles and Teutons, and every, then uh, Crimean uh, Hanat started to introduce and uh, uh, Ukraine was making deals with them. At which point, um, so there was no per se state all these years. After uh, Kiev and Rus, uh, it was completely, it was just not in, existing, like bits and pieces. And then um, starting 1441, uh, the Zaporizhian horse started to take place. Um, it's called siege. So this is um, a settlement of a free uh, spirited people who were Ukrainian Cossacks who were there to um, kind of um, between all these cultures. Um, and they were making unions either with the uh, Crimeans or with, uh, not uh, with uh, Golden Horse, of course, but at some time it was with Lithuanians, with um, uh, also with Poles. And in the end, um, they were used, they started to making unions uh, one by one, first with Paul, but then Poles turned against them. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, unfortunately, none of this worked. And uh, Catherine the Great of uh, Great Russia, of um, Russian Empire, uh, used them up as soon as could, as much as she could to protect her borders and fight the Turkish and uh, Crimean. Uh, Tatars, and when they were no longer needed, she ordered to completely uh, dismantle the siege, and uh, it was actually destroyed completely. And Kazakhs were told not to uh, cause any problems, so they didn't even uh, um, defend themselves because uh, they thought that she's going to change her mind, and they were begging, but that didn't happen, and they were all sent all over. So with that, um, Um, uh, do you, uh, now, uh, in parallel with that, um, so uh, this, um, the Cossack state was called, um, it's, um, it's on the first uh, slide, you can see it, uh, and uh, Yes, Helmanite, yes. Uh, and, and that's what I'm talking about when Catherine, Catherine the Great uh, destroyed. And then on the next slide, you see that uh, Ukraine was completely uh, swollen by, um, uh, gobbled up by uh, Russian Empire. Um, then uh, the next few slides are more of a recent, uh, recent um, history. So um, in uh, 1917 to 19, there was another kind of splash of uh, hopes for Ukrainians to gain their independence. So they were back and forth for two years. There were several different unions and the same thing happened in the end. It all failed. Unfortunately, there were at some point, uh, there were two different uh, states, Ukrainian and Crimean, and then they were all became Soviet Union, just part of the Soviet Union. Um, okay. Um, so many years later, in the end, the Russian Empire finally uh, collapsed and Ukrainian people and Crimean people republics were founded. Uh, Crimean people republic was destroyed by Russian communists and Ukraine, when found itself under the rule of Germany, and turned into Ukrainian state headed by Hetman Pavla Skoropatsky. That's the same history, 17 and 19. Um, then uh, followed the even... Uh, harder times because um, Ukrainians, uh, um, uh, the unitary Ukrainian state carried on war for three fronts and sadly lost Ukrainians' lands were divided between Russia and Poland once again, once again but the struggle did not subside. So, uh, subsurgent armies were carrying on war in Ukraine. And as a result, Russia was bound to grant Ukraine the right for 
autonomy and temporarily reduce pressure on culture. Between 30 and 33 million starved to death in a famine known as a Holodomor. Uh, of course, it's a genocide as part of Stalin collectivization. Stalin always hated uh, Ukraine, probably as much as Putin, because Ukrainians are pretty independent people, very uh, freedom loving, um, and, uh, and they just didn't want to be part of the Soviet Union. And he found a wonderful way to uh, kill them. Um, the most fertile country in the world was starved to death. And uh, until now, we don't know exactly how many people died. It was absolutely horrible. For three years, uh, communists were coming to the villages and taking everything that they could find, one time after time after time. And uh, anybody who was finding any crops on the fields were shot in, in uh, right there. And uh, so right now, the estimates are between four and seven million dead. And that's a national tragedy, and we have a uh, tragic anniversary in Ukraine, which was established in 91 after we gained independence to kind of commemorate all those lost lives. Uh, following on the Russian civil war and collectivization, the great purge um, uh, happened when Stalin was killing preserved political enemies, and it resulted in profound loss of a new generation of Ukrainian intelligentsia, known today as the executed Renaissance. They were making absolutely uh, unthinkable things. For example, uh, there was um, a big meeting announced that um, all the uh, Ukrainian musicians who play a, spe a specific Ukrainian instrument were um, to come and exchange their um, creativity ideas and, you know, uh, so they um, they collected 5,000 of those, they called kobzar. This is kind of like guitar, the instrument similar to guitar. Um, and uh, without any warnings or anything, they were all put in the trucks and executed the same day. 5,000 best musicians of Ukraine in one day. Um, and uh, that was also same with uh, uh, theater, movie, uh, actors, uh, artists, all intelligentsia. Um, and then, of course, uh, started the Second World War started. Uh, Board of Ukraine changed uh, and Zakarpatia took advantage of, uh, of that. And they found a tiny Carpathian Ukrainian um, independent state that is, uh, it's, it's not shown on that one, but it's okay. Um, it didn't live long, but at least there was an attempt. Um, during the, uh, then in, uh, Germany invaded Ukraine in 41, and uh, Ukraine suffered severely, tremendously. Over 700 cities and thousands of villages were completely destroyed. At the battle for Kiev in 1941 alone, almost uh, 600 soldiers were killed and as many captured. A uh, total of close to 20 million of Soviet people perished, and a large part of them were Ukrainians. Ukraine, of all the Soviet republics, suffered the most because, again, uh, it was destroyed on the way to German Moscow and then on the way back. So nothing was left. Kiev was completely destroyed. It was heavily bombed um, the whole during four years. Kind of uh, like what we have now. Uh, and it's uh, so ironic, tragically ironic, that one of the most famous Russian songs about the war starts as uh, um, Kiev was bombed at four in the morning and we were told the war started. And ironically, same exact th thing happened now on February 24th, two years ago. Again, four in the morning, Kiev was bombed. I don't know if he did it specific, uh, on purpose or not. Um, anyways, um, and during the, all those years, Ukrainians still were trying to gain their independence. Um, and twice during the World War II in Lviv and Kiev, uh, attempt, attempts were suppressed by Germans. And in Ukrainian, uh, in, in response, Ukrainians created Ukrainian insurgent army um, UPA. In 1944, underground Ukrainian state was founded, um, and uh, 
and it was um, uh, fighting Germans first, and then after Soviets came over for another 10 years, they were continuing to fight Soviets. Now, they finally were completely destroyed in 54. Um, okay. By the 50s, though, Ukraine has surpassed the pre-war level of industry and production after the war finally completed. Ukraine became a leader in many industries, including hydropower, nuclear power, heavy machinery production, space and aircraft production, etc. When Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine gained independence finally in 1991. Uh, then it had experienced a sharp recession, losing up to 60% of its GDP between 91 and 98. Uh, then severe financial crisis in 2008, annexation of Crimea, Donetsk and Lugansk in 14, and now the full-scale war. But uh, Ukraine is always <laughs> hopeful and always um, seeking independence and believing in the um, happy life. Um, what uh, personally I'm touched most of all is Ukrainian kind of uh, positivity and uh, sense of humor. I mean, uh, sometimes it's kind of black uh, sense of humor, but I want to share with you when this invasion started two years ago, um, they were, these are all true stories. So soldiers are coming, Russian soldiers are coming to the village and the old lady gives them flower seeds and asking them and also the sunflower seeds. And they're like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you for giving it this. And she's like, yeah, yeah, please put it in your pockets. And they're like, what? Well, when are you gonna be rotting on our fields? At least we will have flowers. <laughs> and that's a true story. <laughs> Another story like this also have, I, I'm amazed that they didn't kill her, but that's what she did. And a lot of stories like this, it's, uh, it's like really amazing. During the war, that's what you think about. Wonderful. Uh, another really funny story is that um, uh, we have a lot of gypsies and, uh, you know, they kind of used to steal horses. So now that Russian uh, invaders came and sometimes they leave their uh, equipment and machinery unattended. So what we see, gypsies come, uh, put the tank uh, to their tractor and tow it away to their house. And then Russians came after lunch and they cannot find their tanks and the tank is gone. <laughs> so I thought that's pretty amazing. There are a couple of songs about this in Ukraine. That actually was uh, happening in mass in Ukraine when we didn't have the weapons. That's what Gypsy did, and we were very happy with that. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a little bit of uh, Ukrainian uh, spirit for you. Next slide, please. So I'm going to just touch base a little bit on culture, art, music, folklore, cuisine, and such. So here I'm just showing you just examples of folk Ukrainian art. Um, I'm also kind of a show and tell. So I'm wearing Ukrainian traditional uh, outfit. It's usually consists of, um, uh, this is called, um, the wrist is called vinok. And this is usually for uh, younger women before they get married but they're always very, very bright and uh, colorful and all kinds of different styles through the whole country. Um, then um, the, the shirt is uh, usually embroidered by hand and the regular colors, most typical colors are red and black, but it's black for me right now because of hard times. And always monistas, uh, these are the like red. Uh, red is favorite color for Ukrainians. So the boots are gonna be red, the monista is gonna be red, and you know, um, so they do love colors. And what you see here, it's uh, examples of uh, folk art. Um, the first one called Petrikivka, and that's kind of traditional village art. And they used to uh, put it all on their houses and on like anything they could find. So Ukrainian village is usually very beautiful and people are trying to plant. We are peasants for many, 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 many thousands of years because we have such a fertile uh, soil. We're planting flowers everywhere and we're drawing flowers and embroidering flowers. Everything is about flowers, good food, good life, but we just don't have it. <laughs> but soon we will. 
Okay, so this is Petri Gift, and you can see uh, different application already. Some is decorative, then um, another one is on some um, utensils for the kitchen, um, and then you see it's on the um, exterior of the house. The next one is um, uh, Pisanka, and that's an, another uh, fall card. It's also by UNESCO. Um, these are the three things that are considered the UNESCO heritage for Ukraine. And another one, which is Borscht, which you're gonna try a little later. <laughs> so, but these are the three. The first four slides is Petrikivka, then the uh, um, Easter eggs. That's called Pisanka. And that tradition actually goes back to peasant times, uh, not peasant, uh, pagan times. That's before Christianity. It later was adopted uh, for Easter, but it actually has nothing to do with Easter. It just comes from that time. And it's a very particular way to decorate them. Uh, and Easter, um, uh, springtime, um, the pagans used to celebrate the fertility, the, um, you know, the nature is waking up and eggs were symbolizing fertility. And there were a lot of, a lot of traditions based on that. And Pisanka is one of them. There is a very specific way how you use wax and different dyes and, you know, you dissolve it and it's very beautiful, lots of them. And the third uh, uh, example is also uh, UNESCO heritage and it's called Kovic and these are the uh, sculptures and uh, tiles, the specific sculptures and tiles from Carpathian mountains. Um, another next slide, please. Now I want to show you just a few uh, examples of what kind of Ukrainians we had. These are the artists, the, uh, uh, the most famous artists, which a lot of them you would think they are they claimed by Russian, but they are not. These are actually Ukrainian um, artists and poets. Taras Shevchenko is absolutely the most uh, famous and uh, uh, genius artist and poet um, in Ukraine. And you just have one example of his uh, painting. Ilya Repin, everywhere, Moscow, they all this praise him as a wonderful Russian painter. He's from Ukraine. Um, Guindre, I don't know if you know him, I absolutely love this artist, his colors and this light um, and stuff. From Mariupol, which is destroyed now completely. Um, um, Ivan uh, Ivazovsky uh, from Odessa, uh, he's most famous Marinist again in all Russian museums. And whatever they could find in Kherson and other cities, also everything is gone. Uh, Alexander Murashka, you can see his wonderful work of Girl in the Red. Um, yeah, so he's also was kind of obstructionist and a little bit of realism and um, impressionist, wonderful painter. Um, Mikhailo Boychik, um, you can see uh, an example of his work on now. Next one is uh, Alexandra Exter. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, Alexandra um, Exter, same thing, uh, praised everywhere as Russian, she's Ukrainian, um, and I absolutely love her works. Kazimir Malevich, and famous Black Square, is also Ukrainian. Um, Katerina Bilokur, that's a small reform card, kind of similar to what I showed you before. Pretty famous. This is just one work, but she has incredible collections, just so rich and um, talented. Next one, please. Um, Alexander Arhipenko. Maria Primachenko, this is more of a primitive art, and this is an educated, simple peasant woman, and she just created fantastic uh, uh, body of work. And Ivan Marchuk, these are actually the only one uh, still living artist. Um, I am so lucky I actually was able to meet him in person, absolutely in Kiev. Um, I graduated from Art Institute, so I, actually he visited us and I had the pleasure of talking to him. Uh, absolutely incredible artist. He's still active, he still produces. And how old is he now? 30, 36 or soon 90, 89. Yeah. 
Um, okay, next slide, please. And now um, I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to briefly read to you the names of other famous Ukrainians. Most of them, a lot of them made some huge contributions to the world culture, um, science, exploration, everything. Um, so let's just start with uh, uh, Sergei Parajanov is a famous film director. Alexander Dovzhenko, again, famous film director, Ukrainian, unfortunately killed by Stalin. Steven Spielberg uh, has Ukrainian roots. Dustin Hoffman, actor, he also, um, he, his family is from Bila Tserkva, Ukrainian roots. Leonardo DiCaprio, actor, Odessa ancestry. Uh, Mila Kunis, actor, uh, actress. Ashton Kutcher, actor. Mila Jojovich, actress. Joda Sen, actor, composer, singer. I want to stop a little bit on Joda Sen a little deeper. Joda Sen, I don't know if you know him. Uh, no. Um, he is uh, actually a famous French singer, but he's American born, but he's uh, uh, an absolutely wonderful uh, composer and musician singer. And he, uh, it's funny that his name is Dasen. And the way they explained his grandparents came from Odessa to Ellis Island to New York. And they were asked there, where are you from? They didn't understand the word in English. And, and they just kept saying Odessa, Odessa, just because they, they didn't know what they've been asked for. And the clerk didn't know what Odessa is. And he heard Dasen, and that's how the name came, Joe Dasen. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, David Korpefeld, an illusionist, also has roots uh, in Ukraine. George and Ira Gershwin, composers, you don't need me to tell you about them. Bob Dylan, uh, Petr Tchaikovsky, funny enough, he's not a Russian composer, he's from Ukraine. Uh, Mikola Leontovich and his famous, most famous uh, song is Carol of the Bells. There's quite a story about that. That actually is a Shedrivka. Um, it's now Carol, so it's been um, usually performed at uh, Christmas time, but it's the uh, same story. This is a uh, pre Christian um, inheritance, and it used to be Visnyanka, which is a spring song. And if you listen to Ukrainian words, it actually is about bird flying and stuff. What birds are flying on Christmas? And that explains it was adopted for Christmas. But it's a spring song. And um, another part of the story, real quick. Um, when Ukraine was trying to gain its independence between 1917 and 1919, um, one of the uh, short-lived uh, head of the state was Pitlura, and he actually happened to be a theater um, art director, um, wonderful, uh, very talented person. And he came up with this idea how to promote Ukraine because nobody wanted to support Ukraine. At that time, they only knew the White Army and uh, Russia but not Ukraine. Uh, so he decided that um, uh, create real quick the wonderful Ukrainian choir. And he did so in just about under two months and they had fantastic repertoire and he sent them to a world tour. And they were going with that tour for two years after Ukraine already uh, didn't get the independence. It was, uh, you know, part of the Soviet Union, they still continue to travel. And they actually were performing in Carnegie Hall. Um, and that's where first Carol of the Bells was uh, performed for American listeners. Of course, they wouldn't understand Ukrainian words. So Ukrainian uh, music teacher who was uh, presenting this with his school choir, he rewrote lyrics. And that's what you have for Carol of the Bells. They have nothing to do with the normal words. And the composer who wrote uh, this down, actually the, folk, uh, the, the song is folk, but it's, uh, the arrangement is by Nikola Leontovich, who was a wonderful, another wonderful Ukrainian musician. And he was traveling uh, villages, in the villages collecting the folklore, unfortunately also killed by Stalin. Um, yeah, I don't have the time to explain all that. Um, uh, Vladimir Shainsky, it's a modern composer, probably don't know, but he's very famous. Sergei Prokofiev, Valentin Sirvertsov, Dmitry Tyomkin, Eugene Hartz, 
Serge Lifar, I don't know if you know him, this is most famous French dancer. He is the founder of Paris French uh, State, um, State Ballet, uh, ran from Kiev after he, uh, he was a brilliant pianist, piano player. Um, and when the revolution started, um, the, uh, the uh, re re revolutionary soldiers came to his, he's from a wealthy family. Uh, so they came to his house and broke his uh, fingers so he couldn't play any more piano and he started to dance and succeeded wonderfully. If you look him up, it's just amazing. Um, uh, then uh, Golda Meir, don't need to introduce her from Kiev. Uh, Shalom Aleichem, very famous writer from Kiev. Sergei Korolev, um, you probably know him. He was the head of the uh, Soviet space program from Zhitomir. And uh, another sad story about him. Uh, at some point, he was, uh, he was a brilliant inventor, absolutely. Without him, there wouldn't be, uh, you know, space, Soviet so, uh, space program. Uh, of course, he was arrested at some point by Stalin, uh, was in the prison and they beat him up so badly they broke his uh, jaw and then when later on he was already the chief um, constructor but the say um, he had uh, some problem and he was in this surgery and because they broke his jaw they couldn't open his mouth and he died at the surgical table because of that prison treatment that he that he had and he was absolutely innocent of course needless to say um, Dmitry Mendeleev, the periodic uh, uh, chemical system, Ky uh, Kiev Polytechnical Institute, uh, Lev Landau, physicist, Nobel Prize uh, laureate, Vladimir Vernatsky, uh, probably know this scientist, mineralogist, he's world famous as well. Igor Sikorsky, that one you know for sure. All your helicopters are from him, Kiev Polytechnical Institute. Uh, Karl Sagan, astrophysicist. Uh, Yuri Kondratschuk, space and aviation engineer. Fedor uh, Pirovsky, electrical train inventor in 1880 before anybody else. Um, Boris uh, Paton, electrical welding, amazing person. And uh, he was, he lived till 96 and did amazing work. He the, was the uh, head of Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. Um, Ignat Lukashkevich, kerosene lamp inventor, Again, 1870, before anybody. Makarov, ocean, uh, oceanographer, and uh, got the submarine idea. Mikola, Mikluha Maklai, uh, the most famous um, anthropologist and ethnologist. He was uh, the first one to visit uh, New Guinea. Uh, the little detail that I'm not mentioning here in writing, uh, he visited the cannibals and lived with them for many years. And they treated him well and they didn't eat him. They actually respect him. And he was the only, he was marrying uh, and, you know, studying the types and stuff. It's absolutely incredible example of, and he, he was sick all the time, you know, with his diaries. Uh, he was sick like uh, two thirds of the time with malaria and this and that and lived amongst cannibals. I mean, this is quite amazing. <laughs> So, um, uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Tim, uh, Tim, uh, Timchenko, kinescope inventor, Leonard Svirnov, this, uh, desalination of seawater, there's uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Vyacheslav Petrov, CD inventor, uh, Simon Pouli, X ray inventor, 14 years prior to Germans, Ilya Mechnikov, immunology, you probably heard of him, uh, Nikolai Amosov, surgeon, another great doctor, probably don't know him, Vladimir Havkin, cholera, first vaccine inventor, uh, Yuri Verona, first kidney transplant, uh, successful transplant, Vladimir Baranov, coaching, camouflage inventor, <laughs> <laughs> in 39. Alek Antonov, the world's largest commercial plane, uh, built in 85, 80, 88. And um, it was absolutely incredible how that, that size could actually fly, uh, destroyed by Russians just on the airport. Um, and they could have used it at least, but just destroy it. That just shows their character. Um, Max Levchin and others, 
who invented PayPal in 1998, Alex Shevchenko, Grammarly 2009, this is already startups in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, Jen Kuhn, WhatsApp 2009, Denis Pankrushev <coughs> and team Visual Reality Gloves, Virtual Reality Gloves 2016. And it goes on and on and on. I've just given you a few examples. Each of them has amazing story. Um, now um, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm kind of <laughs> late. Uh, so the traditional food, you're gonna have borscht and this is number one Ukrainian food. Um, it's, uh, it's UNESCO um, heritage item for Ukraine. Russians again were trying to claim that this is theirs, but uh, UNESCO actually said that this is Ukrainian. Uh, other than this, we have absolutely wonderful cuisine, lots of vegetables, very famous, uh, like, you know, dumplings with all kinds of fillers and blintzes, and uh, it's, it's just amazing. And the most famous uh, uh, drink. Of course, there are lots of uh, non-alcoholic drinks, but most wonderful is gorilka, which is vodka, and again, it's Ukrainian. <laughs> so um, I know we have a very tough times, but we're going to prevail. Ukraine will win. Uh, I have no doubt on it, and I just hope that in America we have enough um, people with a uh, clear mind, uh, because right now it's the Americans who can help tremendously, and not just to Ukraine, to the whole world and to America itself, because this uh, shameful uh, Republican behavior and that uh, you know Ukrainian ad help that is being held for many months, every day the people are dying, every day. It's less than 1% of American GBT, uh, G, uh, GDP, um, it won't be even noticed. Um, and most of the money actually will stay in the US because it's going to military production and they're gonna boost the economy. It's absolutely ridiculous and no excuses for that. So anyway, with that, I know uh, the, the standard greeting is Slava Ukraini, Heroem Slava, which means glory to Ukraine and glory to the heroes. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm a little <laughs> running a little over. <clears throat> Any questions? I love the maps, by the way. I need to get those online. Oh, wait, is your mic on? Is it on now? Yeah, okay. Okay. We're there. Um, one more maybe. All right. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So, what's your question? Huh? Oh, okay. Uh, uh. Dick Duda, do you have a question? Yeah, Dick. You had your hand up, Dick Duda? Maybe he doesn't hear us. Richard Duda, no, I, we I, I, are ready to hear your question. Side, we'll see. Oh, there it is. I did see a, a statement of um, something showed up on the screen saying that the bandwidth is low, and then they stopped.
Um, at some point, uh, there also was the uh, Ottoman Empire, but they always collaborated. And Cossacks, actually, the, uh, um, when they had the free state, the Ukrainian Cossacks, they collaborated with uh, Crimea quite a, quite a bit, but then in the end, Russia took over. Crimea did change hands many, many, many times, but uh, throughout the history, um, I, I didn't really do a good job explaining, but uh, more uh, often than not, Ukrainians were collaborating with Crimeans, and now they are together, and there is absolutely no nationalism or racism, or they, uh, they are Muslims. And they're happy, uh, you know, to be part of Ukraine, but we just don't have Crimea at all. Stalin also uh, severely persecuted them, and at some point, he uh, ninety percent of the Crimean Tatars were moved out. And they, after the war, after the Stalin died, they slowly returned whoever survived. It was absolutely horrible. About ninety percent. I, I read some words that the, the ending Anko is a, is a Ukrainian name ending. Which, which one? The, the, the ending in a name, Anko, as in Shevchenko. Oh, Shevchenko, it's yes. Specifically Ukrainian. And Ko, that's specifically Ukrainian, more like, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, let, me, let me bring in the mic. Did the Ottoman Empire also go? Uh, occupy Ukraine? Uh, they did not occupy, invade what they, uh, Ukraine. What they did, they did raids. They were raiding Ukraine for like 300 um, years. And that's why, uh, and what they did, they would uh, raid the village, a little town, and kill all the men and, you know, grab the young ones and young, beautiful women and take to uh, Turkey. Usually, uh, young girls were sold to harems and stuff. You probably know the most famous story about uh, Hurem Sultan, who became uh, the uh, uh, beloved wife of uh, uh, Shah Suleiman. And the only time when he she actually insisted, he in the end she was um, a slave. So in the end, uh, she was very tricky. A quite interesting story. So she insisted that she's very unhappy because she's a slave, so he gave her freedom. Next night, she was not letting him in, and he was absolutely outraged. How come I gave you freedom and you're not letting me in? Uh, the story was like, now, as a free woman, I cannot be with you unmarried. So she forced him to marry her that way. <laughs> and then once he married her, she insisted, and he let go the entire harem and was only with her. <laughs> that was Ukrainian for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Ottoman. And another funny story. If you travel to uh, Turkey now, like if I do, I just walk on the streets and, you know, they all speak this uh, unknown language. But the faces, this is all Ukrainians. It's like back home in Kiev. Guess why? Because 300, 300 years you know, raiding. Before that was Tatar. So uh, Ukrainians are actually very beautiful and smart people, probably because we have in our genes just about anything, because there was the Tatar, you know, the Tatar Mongols and the Crimeans and the Ottoman Empire, Empire and Lithuanians and Polish and Russians, everybody. They just were kind of like Da, 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 one way, da, 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 the other way. And the whole through the history, that's what was going on. Uh, I, I, I see some gestures or sort of smiles on, on the web. Uh, mm -hmm. Dick Hewitson, you got your hand up? I see two hands up, but I don't hear the question. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, that's Hi, oh, I'm Dick Hewitson, and you have just taken me down memory lane. Uh -huh. And I just love it. And I lived in northern Minnesota, near southern Manitoba, where there were many, many, many Ukrainians. And he had wonderful meals of holopchi and yeah. borscht. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad we don't have you here because I have borscht today. <laughs> yeah, and um, I remember there was a uh, there were there was a division among the Ukrainians. 
as to whether you put tomato sauce on the whole tree or you <laughs> Exactly. You were exactly. the tomato people and the non-tomato people. But what I really want to bring up, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about those beautiful, beautiful Easter eggs. Yes. And I had a wonderful collection of them from people there. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, over the years, they've one by one cracked and disappeared. Yeah. Uh -huh. But if you could just explain to people how those are done. It's just an amazing Oh, yes, absolutely, art. absolutely. And, and I have um, a very easy uh, fix suggestion for you. Those Easter eggs actually come wooden as well, and then they would never crack. <laughs> so... yeah, I know, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, the ones I had were all raw eggs. <laughs> True, the proper one, yes. Okay, so yeah. how it's done, um, you use the um, wax, uh, the hot wax, and you put the initial pattern. So you're kind of blocking all the areas that you don't want to color, and you use the first dye. So that, therefore, you have the first color. Then, uh, if it needs to be, you remove some or all wax or add more, because where you add it, it's not going to be painted. And then you do the second layer of second dye, and then it goes on and on and on. So the simpler ways uh, you just have one dye but it's still beautiful like the, the most beautiful uh, easter eggs i do kind of a lazy way uh you just find a nice uh fall leaves and you wrap them around the egg kind of tight and use the onion peel it gives this beautiful ochre color and when you have the leaves it's going to be lighter and the rest is going to be darker so you're going to have this pattern on the layer very easy, environmentally safe, you know, it doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's how it was done. And it's a whole big tradition. As a matter of fact, um, we have a bunch of artists in the uh, Bay Area, Ukrainian artists, their workshops, they usually do that. Pisanka, it's called Pisanka. Uh, so usually in like churches, but I, I know at least like five different places where they do it uh, around Easter time. Uh, also, the courses for Petri Kivka, that's the other very famous folk art, but not for eggs. Uh, Dick Duda, I see you had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Uh, thank you. First, I, I want to thank Milena for that wonderful presentation of the, the detailed history. I'm sure that uh, you were just touching the surface, but it, it was very helpful. Um, thank you. And I, I thought to your list of famous Ukrainians, you should add two of, I think, the greatest violin players of the 20th century, uh, Nathan Milstein and David Oistrakh. Um, of course, yes. How could um, I miss them? But uh, you see, already it was over time. Uh, I understand. This goes on and on. Yeah, but you're absolutely correct. I definitely will add them. But, and the, one question I did have, uh, you mentioned the golden age of the Kievan Rus period, which yes. was destroyed by the Golden Horde, I think, in 1200 or so. Yeah. Uh, I think Vladimir Putin has uh, dated that back to much earlier, even the time of the Byzantine Empire, that the, there was a Kievan Rus Empire. Uh, and, and Putin seems to say that that's why the, these are all one people, despite, as you showed in your maps, all the invasions. Just curious if you would comment on the antiquity of the Kievan Rus Empire. Absolutely, and with great pleasure, actually. This is a very touchy subject for me. So I have to tell you, I grew up in Soviet Union. We were all brainwashed. And to be, uh, I am born and raised in, your, in Kiev, like nowhere else. I was just a normal Soviet kid, very happy, did a lot of you know, hobbies, training, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the history we were taught has nothing to do with reality. Um, it, it was, it's absolutely different. Another, another thing that I never paid attention, who's Russian, who's uh, not, while I was a child, a student, blah, blah. Everybody was together happy, like, you know, just actually, you know, anti-Semitism, there was a question. There is nothing like it in Kiev, you know, when I went to... There was absolutely, I, I think now this is more of a Russian empire thing because there were more Jewish people in Ukraine because there was the line of uh, 
settlement and they were not allowed to Russia and they absolutely hated them and they instigated that hatred. And that's what I believe he continues. But anyway, that's beside the... Uh, the so um, what happened... Um, they rewrote history and they, it did not start with Putin. It was Peter the Great who started that. And actually there was another Ukrainian, actually uh, religious um, figure who um, was um, in Kiev uh, Mohilan's uh, academy. Um, and then he came, he was super smart, very educated. And Peter the Great uh, called him to um, Moscow and then St. Petersburg. Um, and he actually came up with this idea that um, this is how Russians can get the identity because we are all one people and Kiev one rules. Um, then later on traveled to Moscow, which has nothing to do with reality at all. When Kiev was already a huge big uh, um, city with the culture, buildings, architecture, libraries and stuff, Moscow didn't even exist at that time. And um, and then Kiev, Kiev and Rus inhabitants were um, a lot of them were killed, as you know, with the uh, with the Tatar Mongols uh, war and stuff. Um, and uh, Moscow was just completely separate. The, even the Russian language it only it only has thirty percent of the same roots as uh, Ukrainian or other Eastern European languages because Russian is heavily in influenced by uh, Finno-Ugrish and then the Scandinavian languages and Matva and all these northern people. So it's only thirty percent is uh, you know. Um, uh, the same as Ukrainian. So, uh, so th that uh, religious figure came up with the idea that and gave it to Peter and Peter, uh, Peter the Great loved it so much and he adopted it. And since then, they started to put this idea that Kievan Rus migrated later to Moscow. It never did. It's a separate culture, has nothing to do. By that, by doing this, they were kind of gaining the uh, importance and the status. And that's what they always do. They were just stealing everything, even the history. Kind of like what they do now. They go to Ukraine, they loot museums. They even, you know, Potomkin uh, grave, they even took his body out of there from Kherson. I mean, uh, how bad, how low can you go? So um, I hear you and I agree that uh, uh, Putin, by claiming that there is no Ukraine and denazification, which even Tucker Carlson, of all the people, said that this is complete idiotic idea. There is no such thing. How do you do denazification? If I'm born in Ukraine, how are you going to denazify me? That's the only way to kill me or what? I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, like, you know, you can take a girl uh, out of Ukraine, but you cannot take Ukraine out of the girl. That's, you know, we're born with that. So um, I side with you and the whole Russian propaganda is extremely uh, successful and absolutely horrible thing. Um, and what they do now, I think that's, they actually are more successful than even the Goebbels. You know, they definitely became more successful in that. And there are a huge amount of people sitting there and working specifically on that, that task. Now they're going to interfere really bad with American election. Be aware of that. There are all kinds of artificial intelligence all over the place. Please don't believe any of that. Yeah. By the way, we, we've got a few more questions. You might try to keep your answers a little shorter. Yes, I will try. It was okay. just a very painful uh, yeah. question. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, did I see your, your hands up. Yes, I have some question. Uh, my father was born in Ukraine in the yeah. city of Nikolaev. Oh, yeah, Nikolaev, yeah. yes. Yeah, and his family left before the war because of anti Semitism and programs. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And, uh, the, my question to you is it anti Semitism is still in Ukraine or it's been taken, taken out by the new government? Um. That is a very short and easy answer. Our president is Jewish. It doesn't mean anything. 
<laughs> One bird don't bring the spring. <laughs> right. No, I don't believe. And as I said, I'm pretty much in Ukraine a lot. Um, I don't see that at all. As a matter of fact, Ukrainians are now very much sympathizing with Israel. Um, Israel finally figured out that uh, Putin is not their friend. And um, in Kiev, you have synagogues, you have all the Jewish people who don't live even during the war. So that tells you something. Thank you. Well, did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah Russ. Um, first of all, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank the you. history, the culture, very well represented. Thank you so thank much. You. I, I was kind of curious on your take. I wanted to follow up on that question from Richard Duda about yeah. Kivan Rus. I was reading this morning, and I don't know how much I can trust from Wikipedia. All media is kind of biased, but... Yeah. Um, like whatever it was back in the 18, 800s or so, yeah, early on with the Kivan Rus, it felt like what was it? If I remember right, it was Oleg that when Oleg came, yeah, and was leading. I thought was I might say the city wrong, but Novograd, Novgorod, Novgorod. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yes. I thought that yes. was a big part of Kivan Rus. So it's like uh, Western Russia, but I realized Moscow is completely different. Yeah, completely it's fabricated. Like, mm -hmm. But that aspect of early Russian culture right. was part of yeah. Ivan Rus. Yeah. Uh, Novgorod um, is uh, distinctively different from Moscow in a Russian city. There was kind of a, a free uh, republic in Novgorod. And at some point, Oleg, uh, the, the uh, Prince Oleg, did come from Novgorod. Uh, Ivan Rus was trading with them. Uh, so... Um, uh, and he was at some point, he did take over Kiev, uh, but uh, but then later on, uh, which aspect did you want about Kivan Rus? What they did, they did trading and they were exchanging, um, you know, with the, uh, uh, there wasn't really war per se. It, it, and, but, but, but the tribes, I mean, reading the history is so funny because there's yeah. so many different tribes back and forth yes. and you represented it. I, exactly. I, I, I couldn't like, tell if it was Slavic or like, if it was like Val, I, Valgrian, but there was Swedish, Vikings. Yes, Vikings. Where the for, history for sure. came from. Yeah. Um, you know, ancient, uh, like, you know, the people who lived in the territory of Ukraine, they were kind of funny and I love them because they're very similar to what you have now. It's still the same pe people, they're peasant. Any piece of land they're going to start planting, me included. It's just in the genes. Can't help it. But they also are kind of, uh, mm, uh, I think, very open-minded because at some point they couldn't figure out who's going to be a good ruler amongst themselves in Kiev. What they did, they, they sent, uh, uh, you know, they sent uh, a convoy to Sweden and asked them to send uh, a wise people to rule them. They were inviting them. They invited them, and that's what happened. There was ruins. Because they, they didn't think that any of them is smart enough, so let's ask somebody who's smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely had no, you know, no ego. It's it's fine if he's smart, okay. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that take. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and then um, yeah. the, the key one, Rus, really started when um, um, the Christianity, it, it was uh, the... Um, they couldn't decide for a long time which religion to take. They even were considered Judaism, but then uh, they selected the um, uh, Orthodox. And uh, in uh, um, uh, 988, they were baptized. And then from that, kind of the uh, the royal history started, Kiev and Rose and royal history. Uh, I like your story about the gypsies. I get that there, there must be a, a lot of minorities like gypsies and Tartars and so on in, in that part of the world. Yes, yes. We have, um, uh, as I said, Kiev was always, or not Kiev, uh, I'm from Kiev, that's why it's all, the whole Ukraine. It's just such a mixture of everybody. You look at the Dasa, all kinds of nations all together. It actually was a trading uh, city, free city. Uh, so it was never in Ukrainians in general kind of really freedom loving people. They're not gonna tolerate if you boss them around. 
Uh, and um, like Russians, look, they're just taking it, Putin, whatever he says is great. Ukrainians, they don't like it, Maidan, another Maidan. And by the way, that tradition is also ancient. That's from the time when they, they were actually selective, the, selecting the ruler. When they asked for a Swedish, for Vikings ruler, that was part of the tradition. They just couldn't figure out who is good enough, uh, but it was always elected ruler. So Maidan that happened in Kiev recently twice already, that was kind of um, the same thing. So when they had a crisis, entire people would uh, gather on the biggest uh, square. Maidan means square. And they would, uh, it was called the People's uh, Union or something. No, uh, advisory, something like that. And, um, and they would decide uh, together, what would they be? Uh, so when uh, recently there were two Maidans in Kiev, that was the way of people to say that we are completely unhappy with what's going on and we're not going to tolerate it. And they did not, but it got even worse. 